You are listening to Rechurched, a podcast aimed at instigating Christians to be Christian. What's up, Matt? What is up, Ethan? You ready for season two, season episode one? Two, episode one. Here we go. Well, what's up, everybody? My name's Ethan, and I'm joined by my co-host Matthew Mayer, and this is the Rechurch Podcast, episode one, season two. This is a big season. If you didn't listen to the trailer, go back, listen to it. We always point you back before going forward. Yep. Listen to the trailer. We did a really high overview, high level overview of what we're going over in season two. Yeah. In this episode, what are we what are we talking about? Right. So by way of introduction, the teaser or the trailer presented the idea of church history versus church biblically. And we're going to say that a lot in season two, because we want you to understand that just because something happened in church history does not mean that was the DNA of the church biblically. You can look at things that have happened in the mainstream history of the church and say, was that the true church? And what we want to do is look at it then so that we can close the gap now. Right. And there are a lot of things that we're going to unfold in church history that some fruitful, beneficial, true church, some not fruitful, destructive, not the biblical church. Right. So I think there is wisdom in knowing our lineage, spiritually speaking, so that we can be more passionate about being part of the remnant church of today. Absolutely. I think similarly to us as individuals wanting to look back at our own lineage and even destructive patterns that might have happened in our past family line and wanting to stop that ourselves, right? I think is a good picture even to have for the church of us looking back and, you know, looking at a torch that's been passed and seeing where the gap has kind of spread wide open and where it's closed in some points and wanting to, now it's our turn, wanting to close that gap as much as possible uh, with the church biblically and historically. I think that's awesome. I think looking at it that way, knowing that there are things that have happened in our past that a lot of people today will use as reasons why they don't want to consider themselves a Christian, or do you know how much damage has been done in the name of religion? And then there's the opposite, people who are set in their ways of religion because it was adopted by their parents right. and their parents' parents. And you trace that all the way back. I'm like, wait, you're literally following mm. the wrong church right? <laughs> because that's what they think their history is. Right. And I'm saying we're going to look at what the church is supposed to be like biblically. And if we're off in our thinking, we are going to be rechurched because we want to have a biblical worldview in how we pursue Christ and how we do church. That's right. So we really want you guys to come into this, go into this with an open heart and an open mind. Um, All of us have different upbringings and contexts of history. And so um, just like season one, there was a lot of stuff that may have, you know, refined you or maybe even rustled your feathers a little bit. Uh, But hopefully our goal isn't to just, you know, make you upset. Our goal is to show you truth and hopefully we can all grow together. uh, Like Matt said, refining our biblical worldview, which is the point of all this. So this episode, we're going to be talking about church history. Um, Just kind of going into the uh, major time periods in church history. Broad stroke of church history from the inception. And... I did some research. I know, Matt, you did some research. Um, I kind of summarized it into five major time periods, but a lot of scholars and, I mean, pretty much every scholar out there summarizes it in their own way. So, you know, they could have six major time periods, 12, 57, it doesn't matter. Um, But we're trying to do uh, what we think is best to be more digestible for you guys listening um, and for us to be able to kind of lead lead us all through this thread. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, The early church 
starts, like I said, 33 AD ish. 30 AD, 33 AD, the Apostolic Age, run it through 100 AD, the closing of the inspired writers of Scripture at that point. John would have been in his 90s. He would perish and die from old age on the Isle of Patmos. That would be the final book written in what we call the canon of scriptures. That's the book of Revelation. And it wouldn't be for approximately maybe 100 or 200 more years before they would get together and put all of these manuscripts into one book called the Holy Bible. Mind you, there wasn't a lot of dispute over the Old Testament scriptures. Right. They were accepted pretty widely. It was the New Testament books of the Bible that people began to say, well, which ones are which? Yeah. Because then you got the gospel. Is there a gospel of Thomas out there? Is there, you know, a book written by Mary of Magdalene? It's like, maybe or maybe not. But those were not chosen to be in the canon of Scripture. Yeah, and we can go over what it means to, you know, have a book be canonized. We could we could go over that. I think that's in our, our notes for the season ahead. It's gonna it, come it up might eventually. be. I, I don't remember seeing it, but hey, let's do it. You want to do it right now? Or do you want to go through the church age? Let's save the canon question for another episode, but... I think it's super valuable to to go over, but let's continue through these church ages. So, right, so early church starts around 30 AD, goes to about 325-ish AD. I know P, uh, there's tons exactly. of resources. They, they all break it down differently. This is how I was kind of like compiling this um, into just f- five simple ones. Um, but some, some, you know, scholars break it, break down church history into like, 10 or 20 yeah, different Yeah, there's, there's no ages, right way so. to do this. I think our goal, Ethan, would be to make it palatable right. and easily digestible to our listeners. So again, we do not want to get caught up in dates because you can probably push the date that you just shared back about 10 or 20 years, or you can push it forward. Right. But the point would be, I think, around 300 AD is where you would begin to enter into a new age. Why? Yes. Persecution was still relentless from the Roman Empire. One in the first century was Nero, and you can probably replace a Nero-type maniac with an emperor named Diocletian in the 300s. These guys were ruthless. They attempted to stomp out Christianity. They thought they were gods, by the way. Now, keep in mind, if you were required by the empire to declare that Caesar is what? Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. Think about if the Christians during that time are not saying Caesar is Lord, but are saying what? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That was punishable by death, obviously. Hurt some egos. Hurt some egos. The incarceration of early church followers, Christians, as they were known in Antioch in the first century. The murder and um, martyr of countless believers during this time. So again, why would they put their lives on the line for a lie? Right. Well, we know that there were so many witnesses that passed on this message and the Holy Spirit's empowerment that nothing, not the gates of Hades, not man's attempt as an antagonist could stomp out the church. Right. So when the persecution came on heavy in 300 AD, now I'm going to have a perspective on this church period that might differ, Ethan, from some of our research, Okay. while at the same time... It might step on a lot of toes out there, and I'm okay with that. Because remember, we started off by saying, what is a biblical worldview? Understanding how to discern these periods of church history and recognize whether or not it was the church biblically. I've never known you to, like, you know, wrestle some feathers. But. <laughs> <laughs> because there was a guy named Constantine during that time period who was the next Roman emperor, emperor and... A lot of people believe that he was helpful to the cause of Christianity. And I'm going to present a different angle. I believe that his rulership obviously helped along by some of the religious leaders in that time, I think, were one of the reasons we were thrusted into the the Dark Ages, hmm. personally. Yeah. Well, which I, probably took place yeah. maybe, what does that say, maybe around 500 AD? Uh, yeah, looks like it. Yeah, I think... And we can't, we don't have to get into the weeds with it, but uh, I definitely think Constantine is always looked at as a hero of like Christianity. Like he ended persecution, and it's like, yeah, you could look at it that way, and that's great. And that probably led to, in God's sovereignty, that led to like all these councils being able to get together to that's like, right. you know, go through a lot of things that needed to be talked about and discussed. 
and and that that's absolutely great but it also i think led to the uh not deadening of the church but sort of the uh laziness of the church and because because persecution is where the church grows and thrives and then when it's accepted widely accepted it's kind of like everybody like we see today everybody calls himself a christian until until persecution starts happening yeah, until again. something happens that forces your allegiance and yeah. that's what we're seeing in the now over the past several years a lot of issues have forced where our allegiance lies so yes you're absolutely correct i'm not saying bring the persecution on i'm saying because of what Constantine did, whether it was inspired by God or not, what you see in the unfolding of this Edict of Milan or Edict of Toleration was the church getting into bed with the state. What do I mean by that? This is where you would see the beginning of a state religion. Do you know what religion that was? Uh, Catholicism. Roman Catholicism. Which starts around 500, 590 AD, uh, AD or so. I th- I would actually place it probably in 300. Maybe. 300? I'd have to find the exact date, but I'm saying that's Well, what- I would say, yeah, I would say that where Constantine sort of made, the, well, Catholic means universal. Yes. So when you're Constantine made this a, the official religion. The universal religion. It, so, yeah. So let's go back even further. See what I'm talking about? Like, so yes. when you start teasing these things out, you go, wait a second. Okay, God certainly was in the midst of that, he's using it because there's a lot of really good things that unfold in this time period. While at the same time, let's not miss ch- the church biblically for church history. Right, right. R- Rome was the world power at that point. So when they made, Constantine made Christianity the world religion, basically. Persecution that, ceased. Persecution ceased. Thing, and then, yeah. <laughs> and then, the then Catholicism came about, which is universalism, if you want to call it that way. Nowadays, it feels like universalism. Absolutely. They, just, they accept everybody. Um, so, so anyway, the rise of the Roman Catholic Church happens. That's another major the church, milestone. The church, let's say, gets into bed with the state. Right. So now there's no distinction between the state, secular, and the church, sacred. This would obviously cause the state church to begin to control the people. Right. This is the wrong usage of politics. And you see that effect happen or really take more consequences in the next thousand plus years. Yeah, because what did they do? They start to acquire land. They start to acquire mass (laughs) and, and wealth. And what you begin to see is a complete watering down of the scriptures that were supposed to drive the church. And the exploitation of people. That's right. Which is... In the name of what? Religion. Yeah. So the spirit of religion, more than ever, is birthed in this church epic or this church period. So during that church period, you got uh, monasticism start to rise where monks appear. Yes. They don't spawn, but they just, you know, that becomes a thing. Um, Scholasticism starts happening where... You have theologians actually start writing about, you know, more scholarly things uh, about God. Um, You have missionaries really becoming a thing in this period. And you have the spread of Islam happening at the same the same uh, time period. Remember and keep your train of thought. It was during this time period where the scriptures were taken from the people Mm. and they were only using Latin which was a dead language, right. and the people didn't speak Latin. There's so many things happening in this I, time well, period. Well, just think about that. So you're going to what they call mass, and you're sitting there, and this priest up there is reading the homily, that's our sermon in the church, in Latin. And you have no idea what's being said. And you have given or tithed to the cause, all of which says you're guaranteed salvation, or at least a free pass or passport out of purgatory. <laughs> like, and then there's a doctrine of indulgences. Oh right? my gosh. That... And people try to argue to this day, like, Oh, that's not what really what they meant. And I'm like, going, you completely miss <laughs> not only the sinfulness of our own nature and how that's exactly what it was, <laughs> but the evil nature of a state church yeah. that would want to control people. Disarm you... them of truth. That's right. 
and then propagate something that is false. That's right. And that leads us to the Protestant Reformation. Right. So uh, the Protestant Reformation would be probably at the edge of what is called the Dark Ages. Keep that in mind. And I want to call it the Dark Ages because even secular history calls it the Dark Ages. Why? There was so much darkness. Oh, my gosh. You know, there were so many lives lost during that period in the name of religion. Yeah. So is that when the Crusades were happening? So the Crusades probably began around a thousand AD. Okay. So we moved five hundred years, maybe more, from Constantine to um, the Dark Ages to the Crusades. Gotcha. And yeah, this is where you would see the Crusades as we know them, a series of holy wars. Again, this is where church history and church biblically need to be differentiated. Why? Because there were actually people killing each other in the name of taking ground. Now, again, they always use the Old Testament as the example of Israelites taking over some land, but totally different context. God was giving them a promised land, which it's interestingly, they're still fighting over in the Middle East to this day. That's how you know it's true. Yeah. yeah. But I digress. This is when Muslims or or the the, uh, Islamic rulers and the Muslim soldiers began to clash over that land and that city. Mm. So, would it have been Christians, true Christians, who would have been fighting these battles, knowing what we know about the church in the book of Acts? I would say no. Uh, no way. <laughs> but what were they doing while all this is the mainstream and people are looking mm. at religion and the clash and the bloodshed and they're saying, oh, there's nothing good in God. Look at that. People are killing each other. You know what the remnant church was doing during that time? What? Spreading the gospel, mm. serving the people, meeting the needs of the downcast treating the homeless as if they would want to be treated that way themselves. like And protesting the Roman Catholic Church. Correct. Boom. Which, is, which leads us to... The Reformation. The Reformation, which is led by Martin Luther. Not to Fifth. be confused with Martin Luther King. That's right. Martin Luther was a German um, monk, monk. originally. Yeah. That basically nailed his 95 thesis, which is, uh, you know, 95, basically 95 points that he was protesting the Catholic church for um, of what they were doing and why it was wrong. And he, so he nailed that to the door of the, the cathedral, I believe. And it's a famous thing. And that led us to the Protestant reformation where we see Protestants, Protestantism. That's quite a word arise. Protest. Pro, exactly. A lot of people know that, you know that I know they think, oh, you're a Protestant no, protest. <laughs> they protested the state religion, right? Mainly, that the scriptures should not be withheld from the people. So not only was Martin Luther key, there are other really popular names during that time period. One that I talk about frequently is a man named William Tyndale. Mm. Why do I, I would actually say he was the reason we may have been thrusted out of the dark ages. Why? Because he interpreted the Bible. Right. He was the one that interpreted the Bible into different languages and during this time you also have this clash between john calvin and jacob uh jacobus arminian arminius i can't speak um and that's where we get calvinists and arminianism from is that correct yes so and obviously there's so many offshoots so many offshoots it's it's almost overwhelming obviously the mainstream denominations that we're familiar with include baptist methodist some would say Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Lutheran, Anglican, the Assemblies of God, ultimately, Pentecostal, Church of the Nazarene. I mean, the list goes on. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think Calvinism essentially became a denomination as much as it as it became an obsession. Hmm. What do I mean by that? These early church fathers, many of them were brilliant. They did so much writing that hmm. we can glean from. But I said this recently in a sermon. I said, I'm not so much interested in what Calvin said as much as I'm interested in what Christ said. Right. Don't get it twisted. I'll glean from a lot of these church fathers and I read as much as I possibly can, but not to replace the words of Christ. And I think you see these mainstream denominations doing that. There's arguments between Arminianism and Calvinism and this one says... Predestination. (laughs) Your head will explode. Yeah, Guys... 
salvation in Christ alone. So then we move from Protestant Reformation into the general age of enlightenment, Ooh. which leads us then to the modern church. So that's a big, big portion of time, about 1600 AD or so to now. Right. So we'll see a boom. There's a lot of stuff happening. Of global missions yep. during that time period. Obviously, technological advancements. We go through a couple world wars. We go to the inception of the United States of America, which I think one of the episodes will trace. I think it's pretty cool. If you were going to look at the gospel like as a torch, hmm. a torch, okay, the church is a torch, and just follow the torch, that light, let's follow it, from Jerusalem to where it spread in the Middle East to eventually India, and then into Africa, and then Africa kind of bleeds into Europe, and then Europe, which was known as Great Britain, eventually changes over their idea of religion and becomes more like a state church. Yeah. And that caused people who wanted to worship God freely to do what? To leave and go where? <laughs> America. Yeah. The new world. The new world. Yep. And then you follow that torch. And the colonies were founded basically by biblical mm. principles. And then all of our governmental documents have Bible values embedded in them. And then you get the birth of one of the greatest nations in the history of the world mm. other than Israel. And you see, and this is going to be pretty cool when we get to some of these episodes, you see the impact that the Church of Jesus Christ had on state, not mm -hmm. the other way around. The church didn't get in bed with the state in America. The church was responsible for forming the state. Wow. And then this lie that has been the lie of now, separation of church and state, man. I'm going, people will... Take three seconds to Google the yeah. true meaning of separation of church and state and read and, and we'll more go. than the first yield because yeah. Google is a liberal progressive yeah. company and they do not want you to know the truth. People will legit like click on an ad oh. for, the, for that People kill search. me. People kill me. <laughs> so we don't want to get lost in the weeds, but enlightenment um, gave way to a lot of individualism, gave to reason, to science, all these things that people now use to argue faith. Um, and the response to enlightenment was the great awakening. Um, and then, like you said, we have a lot of world wars going on in there and then you have new denominations formed and a lot of key people. And now we're here at the modern church, wow. which has a lot of issues, <laughs> but also some hope as well. Um, so that's sort of where we're going to be. I think that's amazing. Landing. And, yeah. and Ethan, you did an awesome job putting these outlines together. It helps me kind of narrow my research and think through the thoughts to hopefully provide some sticky, memorable content for our listeners. Just to get, again, have a better grasp of the church that you're a part of. Yeah. Not yeah. the local church, lowercase c, the big church, capital C. And in fact, you know what I'll call the church moving forward multiple times? The invisible church. Mm. And we're even going to see like the visible church that you can see isn't always the invisible church, the true church. Mm. And the reason why is because I want to know my history. Yeah. Yeah. And and if there have been men and women of renown who have given their lives for the cause of Christ and I'm disinterested in that mm. and yet I say I'm a part of it, like they they passed, to use the torch analogy, they passed that torch to us, Ethan. So I think there's a benefit in looking backwards again. Oh, absolutely. Having the eyes to discern the difference between church history and church biblically, I think is yeah. really going to help a lot of people grow in their understanding of our lineage, spiritually speaking, as well as edify our faith today to be more passionate about the gospel. Yeah. I, I would call them um, not only the invisible church, but also the silent minority because we have the silent majority here in the U.S., but... It's the it was the silent minority. They were always in the background, doing the hard work. But it wasn't the majority; it was the minority. And you it was know a small what? Group. That's such a good point. I think we can close out on that. Um, again, back to what it means to have a biblical worldview. So there is a silent. You said minority or majority? M minority today. Yeah. So I, w I would say I would say I would say the whole time for the most part it was always a, a, a silent minority because there was so many. Even back in Acts, you had so many different. Uh, you had Gnosticism rise up. You had all the this all these false gospels immediately rise up, 
in the name of Jesus, in the name of faith. But it was always the silent minority that just did what Christ calls us to. I love it. And they were loud. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. The, like the the false messages were loud. Yeah. And the you say silent silent minority. I'm going to actually say the obedient remnant. Ooh. Just constantly chipping away with constancy and consistency. So today, I would say, I think that might be true even today that there's a mm. silent minority, the true church, the remnant church. And I can almost make a case using statistics, and this is what where we'll end. Biblical worldview, Christians that were polled, mm. only 6% prescribe to a biblical worldview. And again, when you understand what a biblical worldview is, when you see some of the tenets of what makes a worldview a biblical one, then you actually would look at the 94% that say they don't have one and go, then you're not a Christian. And I, are you saying I'm not a Christian? I'm saying based on your belief system, not being consistent with the scriptures, then yes. I'm not saying it. The Bible saying right, that you're not, not. Are you ready for this one? One out of three pastors hold to a biblical worldview. That's Shouldn't that be scary. three out of three? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and now, now multiply that. One pastor could oversee a flock of 100 to 10,000. So how many people are being influenced based on that one mouthpiece, either with a biblical worldview, which is seeing the whole world through the lens of the Bible, or not seeing their circumstances and their world Man. through the lens of the Bible, enter into what we would call progressivism, progressive Christianity. Back to season one, if you're interested in some of the false gospels, that is where you will find them. Season two is going to be exciting. Yeah, Probably going to be a deep dive into our, our outline that we have with the episodes, but Gosh, this was a lot so far. Just to give people a heads up, I'm going to take our time in the next several episodes when we're looking at some of these topics that might include, again, you know, where did the Old Testament come from? How did, you know, when Moses wrote those five books called the Pentateuch, where did they get spread to? And how did how did it become known as the Old Testament and the Torah? Like, I think all those will help us understand why the New Testament is connected to the Old Testament and why the church, generally speaking, always had the great organizer and the chief architect in the Holy Spirit. It's because right. they never disconnected from the scriptures. Right. So yeah. all of this is going to go back to what the Bible says. Yep. Amen. I think um, the, the obedient remnant, the silent minority, and the invisible church are maybe great merch ideas, honestly. I love it, dude. They're all like... <laughs> um, Make church, si yeah. <laughs> what was the what was the one? Make, I thought it was make church or wait, was it make church biblical again? Yeah, make church biblical again. That was even better. Make church biblical. Again. Yeah, so we'll see if if you guys want you know some uh, rechurched merch, <laughs> rechurched merch, man, that's, we are on a roll. Then uh, you know, let us know. You know what? Before we go forward into talking about the church now, we first have to go back and talk about the church then. And that's what we're going to be talking about next episode. Yes. We're going to define ecclesia. In fact, most recently I did a sermon that dealt with what is the ecclesia, as Jesus mentioned it in Matthew 16, where he said he's going to build his church, ecclesia. It is an actually, it's actually a political word, and it was derived from the Roman slash Greek worlds where the people would be called out or heralded to gather public assembly, called out ones. That's what ecclesia means in Greek, called out ones to do what? Gather in a public space to talk about the common concerns of the day. And this is what Jesus pulled from, that word. And I often say, and I'll say it again when we record our next episode, he took a secular establishment, this idea behind it, and he made a sacred movement. And that began the early church. After he died, rose from the grave, and the Holy Spirit fell, what did the church accomplish that the gates of hell or death or Hades, however you want to cut it up, could not prevail against it? And we're going to look at that. We're even going to look at how the ecclesia today is still 
overcoming the gates of Hades. Mm. And what is the gates of Hades? So there's a lot there. There's Looking a lot forward there. to episode two, teasing out Ecclesia and the church of the in the book of Acts to the church of today. Yeah. So before we go there, we're going to just close out this episode, guys. But uh, if you're looking to find more information about our podcast, please visit rechurchpodcast.com. You can learn more about us. You can even ask a question about what you've learned so far. Um, and we're going to, uh, like last season, we're going to have a Q&R episode at the end of this season where we'll answer your questions to the best of our ability. So go to rechurchpodcast.com, ask your question, and that about wraps this episode up. We'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. Thank you, guys. Bye.